Hello again, everyone, and welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd. We are so glad you could join us for the next hour of Good Gardening. For the next hour, we'll be answering those gardening questions. And as you may already know, we will not be taking your phone questions for the time being. You can still submit those questions and pictures via email, byf at unl.edu. Tell us where you live, please. And do not forget to check out Backyard Farmer on our social media pages. That's Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Pinterest. So with all that stuff out of the way, let us get started with samples. And Wayne, I'm guessing you're just not the best at growing house plants. <laughs> Typically, I can handle something, but my favorite house plants are those that wilt a little bit, tell me to water them, and then they uh, get watered. However, sometimes you can end up with some things on your house plants that are a little more difficult. Um, this one is obviously not doing so hot. Uh, it fell victim to our uh, little mealybug friends. You can see the white fuzzy mass remnants of this one after the plant got isolated from the other plants because I didn't feel like trying to save it. And then this one over here is one I managed to save because we had uh, all of our house plants ended up with some mealybugs on them. And I took them outside in one of those warm March days when we were in shutdown and I hosed them off really good with a good um, jet of water. So that got them cleaned up initially. And then I've been about every three or four days going over them by hand and picking off any remaining mealybugs that happen to show up. I have a toddler at home, so I don't want to use anything that he may chew on. And then you can see here, we have one of the little ones. See that white speck? At this point, it only has one little tail, if you can see that. When they get bigger, they have two wax tails coming off of them. Uh, so they get quite a bit bigger than this. They're about, uh, oh, about an eighth of an inch when they're full size on these. And I'm slowly killing and squishing my way out of mealybugs. <laughs> and you know what I would do if that was my house plant? It would end up in the compost pile. <laughs> end of discussion. <laughs> All right, Kyle, this is sadness on your part. It is. Um, yeah, so I have some oak leaves, and they are su succumbing to anthracnose. Luckily, it's a very, very minor anthracnose, but anthracnose is one of those fairly common um, diseases that we, it, and really, there's an, a type of anthracnose for pretty much every plant out there, but they are different, uh, different fungi that actually, that actually cause the disease onto different plants. And this is, so this is anthracnose on oaks, and Again, not, not, te not too bad, but a few things I'd like to draw attention to is, first, just kind of how deformed the leaves are. Um, so the leaves are kind of curled down, that, that often happens. And then we just have these little spots that are occurring and, they are, um, and they tend to be following the veins. So anthracnose tends to infect when we have kind of cool, wet springs. And I was kind of thinking about how this past spring has been, there's been it's been kind of cool, it's been kind of wet. So when we have that delayed bud break period, that's just more time for the fungus to cause infection while, in, while the leaf is still inside of that bud. Once the leaf comes out, it's more or less, um, it's not near as susceptible to anthracnose as when it's inside of the bud. As far as control, you know, not, not a whole lot to do. Um, best thing is just maintain overall tree health if it is a very, um, if it's a, if it's, or there are certain limbs that have been having anthracnose year after year, there's, you most likely have a canker a little bit further back on that limb. So maybe do some pruning to increase airflow through there as well, that can help. But unfortunately, it's just one of those things that we tend to see on our, on our big mighty oaks. Too bad, and it looks a little bit like herbicide damage, I'm sure, to a lot. There's of a little bit of that yeah. left. Yep, there's a lot, of, a lot of chemicals are flying around right now, so. Yeah. All right, Kyle. Okay, Kelly, you have a weapon with you. I, I do. I have my pruning <laughs> shears. Um, I have a Japanese yew here, and it is time to prune these Japanese yew. It's a great time to do it, and it'll help to keep them from getting out of control as they grow. And what I wanted to demonstrate here is a lot of times people will like to shear these. They'll just come with a hedge trimmers or something, and they'll just kind of just make a cut and shear. And if you like that formal look, very formal, that's, that's okay. You can do that. 
but sometimes it kind of loses its natural form. So if you like a little bit more of a natural form, I just wanted to demonstrate here, you want to control size. So uh, maybe it's the width if it's growing this way, um, even the height if it's growing up and down. And one way to prune a little more naturally is we, what we call a thinning cut. Um, we also refer to it as doing a drop crotch cut. So I'm gonna go all the way back here and you'll see how much I reduce the width and or the height and cut it off right above, I maybe even left right above where there's another branch. And if it's growing this way, again, this one will come out, looks more natural. This one will come out and keep growing that direction, but you've uh, greatly reduced the width um, or the height if it's up and down of that tree. And then just a reminder with evergreens, never prune back beyond where there's any green on the twig. Um, because well, use you can sometimes get away with that with use. Uh, you won't get away with it with the majority of uh, evergreens, with all the evergreens. And even with use, it would if they recover, it would take a long time. All right, so excellent. We'll go ahead and prune, but try to maintain that natural form. Good, good time of year to do that pruning. We're in the window. All right, pictures. Um, Wayne, your first one here is from Council Bluffs in the Lust Hills, back pasture. She's got a maple, <laughs> it looks like this. What is that? And then we had a green, what is that, on a silver maple, and this is Lincoln. So you've got two different people, two different locations, two different sets of measles. Same culprit. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> this is the maple bladder gall mite. Um, this is a fantastic, infestation. I've never seen one that thick mm -hmm. and that bright of a, of a color to go with it. Uh, this is this happens from time to time. You can get them on one tree one year and they'll be gone the next. Uh, not necessarily anything to worry about. It's purely cosmetic. If it really bothers you, you can pick the leaves off that are affected. If the tree's a little larger, like some of those maples can be, it might be a little difficult for you to pick them all off. But then again, most of them will be higher than what you can see anyway. All right, now we have a Grand Island viewer for your third picture. Uh, this is a thornless cockspur hawthorn. Has several twigs that look like this. He says they're sticky. Some of the twigs have begun to turn a little bit black. They did cut those twigs out. They wanna know what's causing it and is there a treatment? And I think we zoomed in on this, didn't we? Yes, this is aphid damage. Mm -hmm. This is typical uh, damage for a lot of aphids, especially spring ones on woody plants where they cause that stunting of the growth point and the bubbling of the leaves. That black is actually some of Kyle's fungi growing on the honeydew mm -hmm. produced by the aphids. The aphids suck a lot of sap out and they filter it for some of the uh, finer nutrients that are a little harder to get out of plant sap and they excrete the excess. So as far as control, right. we're looking at um, if you catch it early enough, the hose does work, especially if it's a small enough tree. I do recommend when you do something like that on a tree, get the brass jet nozzle. Mm -hmm. Don't go with just the dial turn, what you get in your box store. Those generally don't have a good enough stream of water to reach up real high and to wash things off. You can use some of the insecticidal soaps as well, or uh, like a permethrin topical would take care of it as well. All right, excellent, thank you, Wayne. Okay, uh, this is a crab apple in Omaha, okay. Kyle. Uh, bloomed uh, beautifully for about 10 years. Two years ago, the trunks started to look kind of funny. Last couple years, the leaves have gotten smaller. Um, I think we have a picture of the, the, what remains of the leaves and they're yeah. off color. What do, what do we think this tree has? Oh, it's dealing with one of the some sort of canker, and that's that, that first picture that we were seeing at the, at the beginning. Um, unfortunately, it can be kind of, kind of difficult to identify cankers purely based on, purely based on photos. Um, with crab apples, though, um, fire blight does cause a canker, and there is some kind of orange discoloration on there. So mm -hmm. fire blight cankers often do have a little bit of orange on them. The other thing is Baltrosferia cankers, um, and Baltrosferia cankers, often come in alongside of fire blight as well. So it's kind of the, so you have this bacterial disease and then the fungus that's coming in and taking advantage of a weakened plant. As far as control goes, this um, is likely one of those prune at ground level situations and start thinking about a replacement. Excellent for you. 
Yes, not, uh, for, not, not, for, not for the viewer, <laughs> un sorry, unfortunately. All right, we've had some questions about what's up with my Japanese tree lilac or Japanese lilac. Uh, this particular viewer is in Lincoln. She thinks it is bacterial blight. And yes, and I, I agree with her. Um, most of the lilac questions that we've been getting have been uh, primarily frost injury, but uh, really looking at distribution on this and how the leaves are kind of crinkled like that really makes me think that, it's, that it is bacterial blight. As far as control for this one, you know, there are some, there are some copper, um, copper products that are advertised to control for bacterial blight of, of lilacs, but they do not provide the best control unless you're working at a, at a seven to 10 day um, spray schedule. So, so really, whenever we're dealing with this, um, those, some of those cultural controls will be your best friend. So uh, pruning to increase airflow through there, proper spacing when you're first planting them can make a big, um, can make a big difference as well. All right, so she has done some pruning and used a copper fungicide, but keep pruning. Keep yeah, keep, keep pruning and exit. Um, I, I do know, I don't know some people that use the copper products quite often, um, but again, you have to be really following that spray schedule. The nice thing is it's getting warmer and bacterial blight on lilacs kind of goes away in the warmer temperatures. So we're kind of getting out of that, out of that time of year where this will be a problem anyway. Excellent, thank you, Kyle. Mm -hmm. This comes to us from Scotts Bluff, Kelly. Uh, it's a linden and 25 years old in the front yard. The roots are coming up from above the ring around the base. Uh, they're careful with the lawnmower. They do want to know why the roots are growing up atop the grass and how they should care for it. And then they also sent uh, same linden, different question. What is causing the splitting in the bark? And this seems to be increasing within the last years. The tree is about 30 to 40 feet tall. Okay. Well, on the first picture in the roots, in the picture I really couldn't see the roots. Um, it's not typical for linden to have those surface roots like it is for silver maple, but any tree can uh, end up having surface roots. Uh, if the soil is a heavier clay soil or compacted, um, tree roots use oxygen, so they need oxygen. Maybe if you turn on your automatic irrigation system, if you set it and forget it and never shut it off, and that soil stays you know, uniformly wet and never has a chance to really dry out or stay moist, sometimes, again, that may cause those roots to grow a little closer to the surface. So if, if the roots are coming inside that circle, you may wanna remove that circle. That's not always a great thing to put around the mulch. I know it holds that mulch in there, um, but if it's too deep or something, that can, they can hit it, and maybe they'll grow up and over it. Could try that. And on this, on the branch, that's a branch that has what we call included bark. So that is a, a point that's prone to potentially decay, potentially just a weak point for breakage if there's uh, heavy ice or windstorm. What happened there was, you know, the bark, the bark just kind of grows, we call it ingrown bark as well, or included. And I guess it's, it's still a small enough branch that, that should have been pruned off, you know, when it was maybe an inch to two inches in diameter. Looks like it's about three to four inches, so you could still prune that branch off. Hopefully it doesn't affect the overall appearance of the tree too much. But in the long run, that probably would be a better thing to do All than right. leaving it. Now you have another one that's very interesting. <laughs> uh, this is an old cottonwood, 10 and a half feet in diameter. Wow. Struck by lightning about four mm -hmm. or five years ago, blew a strip off, and it looks like this. Okay. So <laughs> yeah, definitely a lightning strike, and it... it uh, yeah, it, that when lightning comes down, I mean, it heats up. It's like steam, and it like blows off that bark. And a lot of the energy is goes out instead of inward. So that's why the tree can hit, be hit by lightning and continue to live for some time. You can't it can't do anything for it. It looks like they haven't tried to cover it or use a pruning wound. So I commend you for that. That's good. Don't do that. Um, my concern in looking at this, I think in the email they said branches had been dying mm -hmm. and they'd been pruning them off. So as I look at that tree, it almost looked, you know, like it's, you know, asymmetrical. So there's a lot more um, leaning on one side and it almost looked like it was maybe towards a fence, maybe the house. So my, my only concern with this tree was would, as you're pruning off those dead branches, if you're affecting that biomechanics. So now the wind load on that tree is affected. Uh, nothing really that you could do, but maybe have a professional arborist or certified arborist come out and, and assess it and take a look at it. But definitely keep a close watch on it. Um, I'm probably more concerned about 
the, you know, the biomechanics and maybe of an increased risk for wind issues. I think if I had that one, I would be, uh, <laughs> I'd have a really nice chip pile. Yeah, it, it, <laughs> it, it is definitely, you know, you always say if it fell, what would it hit? And it's definitely yeah. leaning towards, uh, there's a white picket fence there, so I'm assuming the house as well. And hopefully there isn't a, like, children's right. playground or a patio area, just, right. um, that's probably good advice. <clears throat> right. Chip it. <laughs> you know, we love our vegetables here on Backyard Farmer. We also all agree that something sweet from the garden is also a treat. Everybody would benefit from growing strawberries and their tart sweet taste really can't be beat. Let's take a few minutes to hear from Kathleen Q about a few strawberry basics. If you're into growing fruits and you don't really want to wait to have to have a fruit tree grow up to size to start producing. One easy plant that you can grow here in this area are strawberries. Strawberries are super easy to grow. You need a little patch of ground to put in a few plants and they do really well here. When choosing strawberry varieties, there's three different types that you can go for. One is called the June Bearers and those are the strawberries like Early Glow and Jewel. And those types are producing majorly through mid-June through early July. Then there's the ever bears. The ever bears are a little bit of a misnomer in that they produce fruit uh, in the spring and in the fall of the year. So there's actually two crops that you get from the ever bears. And then there's the day neutrals. The day neutrals are the ones where you, they produce a little, a few fruit all through the growing season. And so of those three types, the one that hands down is gonna produce the most fruit for you are the June bears. And the June bears are ones that produce lots and lots of structures called runners. Uh, runners are above ground stolons that can produce new plants all along the length of those stolons. And so what happens over time is that they colonize an area and when that occurs then you end up with something called a strawberry patch which a lot of us are pretty familiar with and so those are the three types that you can use then when you're looking at site selection for the different strawberry varieties that you want to grow think about high ground and in an area that gets 10 or more hours of direct sunlight daily and the reason you want high ground is because they're less likely to be hit by frost. They're more likely to uh, have the good air circulation they need so that there's less diseases overall. And then the third thing is that if you don't, if you have them on low ground and there's a, any kind of flooding, the crowns aren't gonna handle that water very well. Keep in mind that there's a couple of things that you wanna do to make sure that the strawberries do well. In a clay soil or a sandy soil, Adding compost does wonders as far as improving the tilth of that soil and making it better drained. So those are factors that you'll want to put into play when putting, uh, choosing the site and then putting the plants in. And when you're looking at purchasing plants, there's a couple of different ways you can go. You can purchase through catalog companies, in which case you'll get them as dormant bare root plants, or you can buy containerized plants like these are. And when it comes to putting strawberries in containers, that's certainly one of the options, but one of the more limited options, okay? The thing to remember is that strawberries um, can die when air temperatures get below 15 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's the crown portion of the plant that that can occur to. And so having them in containers makes it more challenging to keep them above that 15 degrees Fahrenheit. And then winter mulching is gonna be an important factor to keep the crowns alive through the winter months. So that's a key concern as well. And when you're purchasing these, a lot of times the garden centers and nurseries will have the live plants, whereas the catalog companies will have the dormant plants. Do keep in mind that every so often you are going to have to renovate that strawberry patch to keep it healthy, keep it bearing the fruit that you want. You know, unfortunately, you can't like grow the chocolate that you can <laughs> dip them in. You have oh, you to. you can't? No, not here. I've been failing. <laughs> All right, Wayne, here we go with some interesting fun pictures for you. Uh, this first one, she found these eggs on a leaf of grass near a pivot point near Colon, Nebraska. The field was soybeans last year. She says corn's at V2, so what is this insect? This is likely uh, 
True army worm would be my first guess on this one. A uh, large mass of roundish eggs on a grass blade. Uh, can be a serious crop pest um, if there's enough of them. Um, lots of things love to eat these. Uh, if you're only finding one here or there and you're not finding a lot of them around, probably not something you're gonna have to worry too much about. All right, army worm. Hmm. All right, so here's your second one. Um, this is a heritage raspberry patch in Hastings. She found this when she was cleaning out the dead canes uh, late April. Any idea what they are in this patch of raspberries is 25 years old. Impressive length on the raspberries. Mm -hmm. Yep. Those are katydid eggs. Mm -hmm. See these once in a while. Um, they are laid on the surface and if they didn't die over the winter, they'll hatch into little tiny katydids. So in that now, perfect little line. Yep. Now there are some meadow katydids that like to munch on your raspberries when they're getting to mature fruit. I fight them every year. Okay, so watch out for little tiny munching creatures. Yeah, they get a little, by the time you're bearing and they're eating it, they're about an inch long, so very little easier to spot. All right, and then you have a third one, which is uh, Omaha viewer has a clump service berry. She says it's had lace bug for several years. Each year it's gotten worse. Uh, she tried the water spray, didn't seem to have any effect. She does a good spring fall cleanup. She wants to do something that won't harm pollinators or birds. At this point, uh, wait till after bloom, hit it with a permethrin type product to knock those lace bugs back. Permethrins tend to be short lived in the environment and uh, the, in terms of when we look at edibles, when we use permethrin, the pre-harvest interval is much shorter. It's one of our shortest pre-harvest intervals as far as a synthetic insecticide product. All right, thank you, Wayne. Okay, rots and spots, lots of spots on this one. This is your first one here is a hydrangea and this is a traditional one. So this is one of the panicle type okay. hydrangeas. Uh, she, uh, sh she did get it last year. Here's the plant itself. And then you can see the picture. I think I, we had a little close up of some of the kind of the darker spots. And we did get this a lot last year from viewers too, Yeah, Kyle. and really, um. And I think those, those spots on the leaves are an indication of something going on down below. Um, so I think that uh, we're dealing with some sort of root rot that's, that's occurring here. And then, as the, um, and then the result of that root rot on the stressed plant is going to be kind of this bronzing coloration that occurs, um, occurs on the foliage. Also, the leaves are a little bit brighter green. That can be an indication of overwatering too. So I think, yeah, just let it dry out a little bit and hopefully those leaves will green back up. All right, so now we have one in Beatrice. She has a honeysuckle vine that is looking like this, beginning to flower and then looking like this. What do we recommend on this one? Um, so I think this is a honeysuckle leaf blight. So we have these blighted leaves, it's on a honeysuckle. Pathologists are great at naming things, so it's honeysuckle <laughs> leaf blight. Um, but this is this is a fungal pathogen, um, and Solobacidium deformans is the the name of that of that pathogen. And as far as control goes, um, again, you know some of those cultural controls, so proper spacing, pruning to increase airflow, things like that will greatly help. If you are looking for some sort of chemical control, um, products that contain chlorothalonil um, should work on this. But if you're seeing this much, much this much injury, I'd probably bring out the pruning shears first, and then um, instead of the instead of the chemicals. All right, excellent. So this one, uh, your next two, I think, are annuals. This is on um, a basil that's on her deck. So she's wondering what those black dots are. Yeah. Um, a, a little bit tough. This is one of those that I would say I'd recommend that you would send into the send, in, send into the diagnostic clinic. But we we're kind of kind of slow right now um, <laughs> with everything that's going on. But um, could be a few things. Uh, basil um, can be hit pretty hard by downy mildew, um, which is one of our fungal pathogens. But I don't think that's necessarily what's going on. I would expect the uh, black dots to be larger if that were downy mildew. And so I think this might actually be a, ba a bacterial blight. Um, again, we had, and those lesions are kind of sunken as well, and that can be fairly common on bacterial diseases. As far as control for this one, um, not, a, not a whole lot that can be done aside from, aside from pruning it out. 
on the bright side, it's not going to not going to affect your pesto or anything like that that you're making later on. All right, and one final one, and this is actually bell pepper in the garden that's looking like this. She, uh, this is Cambridge, Nebraska. They did cover them when it got so cold. See, and I, I think that this, the covering may be what's what's ending up with these these spots here. Um, at first, I was thinking it might be might be bacterial spot of peppers, but some of those lesions, you know, some are crossing the veins, some are not. Um, and so I really wonder if it's not just a result of the the covering being on top of the being on top of the pepper causing a little bit of injury um, for that covering was touching the leaves, uh, extra excess moisture there, and you can't get an edema that forms. So I think that's the case. It should grow out of it. All right, thank you, Kyle. Kelly, a couple tree questions again. Uh, your first one here is Waverly. It's a honey locust. He has put a circle around his area of concern, which is a, right, a, a branch, kind of a wound right there where the main branches hit the trunk quarter of an inch deep. Um, he hasn't seen woodpeckers. I think we have a close up on it. Mm -hmm. He can't really prune it out. He's wondering whether he can expect this tree to continue to live since he can't prune it out. Okay. Well, yeah, I, I don't have too much concern with it. It looks like a larger wound than two inches by a fourth of an inch deep. I'm not really sure what caused that actual wound itself. When you look deep in there, and Wayne, you can say whether you agree or disagree, but it almost, when you zoomed in, it almost looked like frass in there, kind of a wet frass that was in there. So, and I don't know if, so probably some type of a bore, honeysuckle has different, different bores as wide as that is. Do you think it could be apple twig bore or? It's hard to say. There's, yeah. a, there's a large number of bores that get into our hardwoods and they, they may be named after one specific tree, like honey locust bores mm -hmm. tend to get into honey locusts, but they hit a wide range of hardwoods and vice versa. So it could be any of those, and that looks like a woodpecker that tried to get in there to get at that yeah. juicy bore. It might have been rub. because yeah. the wound itself. But yeah. if the tree is otherwise healthy and, and growing fine, I, I think it should create wound, wound wood and seal it, not seal. Yes, seal. Seal mm -hmm. off that wound and the tree should be fine in the long run. All right, and then you have one more, Kelly, and this is actually Portsmouth, Iowa. Okay. It's a Deborah maple um, and doing great. And then she noticed some things that uh, on the, on the uh, branching there. She doesn't think it's critter damage. What is all this splitting and wounding? Well, this one's a little bit more concerning than the, the mm -hmm. one on the honey locust. So in, it, Deborah is a type of Norway maple. And again, it's hard to say what caused that original wounding. It could have been sun scald. It's, it's kind of high up on the tree to be sun scald. That's usually lower down on the main part of the trunk. Mm. Um, but maybe if it's on the west side of the house there and it's on the west side of the south or southwest side of the tree, maybe um, it could be, again, a wound, just a wound. Maybe a hail, hailstone hit it. And for some reason, that tree didn't respond very well to it, even though it looks like it's growing well and vigorous and healthy. Uh, there's not a lot to be done. Um, it, the tree is either going to s seal off that wound or it's not going to. It is concerning. So I often tell people on that's it's a smaller tree. So that tree can grow and do well. And maybe about the time it gets to be a large tree providing good shade, then that wound will catch up to the tree or the chemical defenses will go down and decay will spread throughout the tree. So on a younger tree, sometimes it's worth it to remove it and replace it. So in 15 to 20 years, you have a tree without a wound that you have to be concerned about. All right, thank you, Kelly. Well, our plants are finally out of the greenhouse. They're hardening off out at our garden. We feel pretty good about getting them planted next week. So let's hear from Terry James about what's going on in the backyard farmer garden. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, it is finally planting week. We've got all the plants out. We've had wonderful weather to harden those plants off. Cool, mid 60s on the eastern part of the state. Cloudy in the morning, sunny in the afternoons, nice breeze, so they are looking fantastic. We've looked at our map and we've we remembered where we planted everything last year. Remember, potatoes, tomatoes, peppers, and eggplant are all in the same family. So we're gonna make sure that we rotate away from where we planted those from last year. We don't want any extra disease pressure on those plants. We haven't planted anything yet. It's gonna happen this weekend. 
We're going to make sure that we are doing lots of mixes again this year. So we're gonna have flowers and vegetables together. We're gonna have lots of color. And then we're gonna make sure that we are putting all of our mulch down so that we don't have any soil splash up on our vegetables. So stop by the Backyard Farmer Garden and check it out. Thanks to Terry for the extra hard work she's done getting this year's garden off the ground because due to the pandemic, she's had to take on a lot more responsibility for the garden this year, including getting all that planted this week with just a little bit of help. Right now, it is time for the lightning round. Are you ready, Kelly? I'm ready. All right, this is actually a COZAD viewer who has a question about Christmas slash May Day cactus. Is it day length, temperature, or both that affects the blooming? It's both. So you need those short days, so you need darkness from around 5 p.m. to 8 a.m., and complete darkness, and you need cool temperatures, cool nighttime temperatures. All right, this is a Ponca viewer who had a 2,4-D drift about six days ago on his garden. He's wondering, is it safe to eat the spinach, onions, and radishes? Uh, no, I wouldn't eat those. I mean, there is no research. To, uh, they don't do research. They don't spray them and then do research to see if it's safe. So we can't say it is. We can't say it isn't, but we'd rather play it safe. Anything like spinach where you're eating the leaf, don't eat it. Play it safe. All right. This is a Henderson viewer who has a bunch of volunteer asparagus coming up in his asparagus patch. Will it turn into asparagus? Yeah, it definitely will, but you don't want get, to get it too thick and too dense, so you might want to do a little bit of thinning. All right. Uh, do you need to stress apple trees to get them to bear fruit? No, you don't. Um, they just, they need a self -poll another pollinator. They're not self-pollinating, so they need another pollinator nearby or make sure you're not spraying at blooming time so the pollinators can pollinate. All right. Thank you, Kelly. Ready? Always. <laughs> Always. All right. Kyle, this is a Wood River viewer who wants to know, is there a preventative for the lawn diseases that apparently are really troubling their lawn every single year? Uh, depends on what the disease is. Um, without knowing what we're battling, we don't really, can't recommend anything, but most likely, yes, there is a preventative if we can find out what it is. All right, uh, we have about four viewers saying, can they pick off those cedar apple rust galls? Will it make any difference? I mean, you can pick them off, they're old, be more next year, but yeah, pick them off as much as you want. All right, uh, this is a viewer who has uh, nine bark that has had powdery mildew every single year, now has dying branches. Is there anything she can do to stop the powdery mildew? Um, you know, the, some copper, uh, copper fungicides can work in those situations. Other, anything you can do to increase airflow through the area will decrease powdery mildew, but if you're already getting some branch dieback, it might just be time to think about something else for that area. All right. Uh, what are the white fuzzy dots that are on choke cherry leaves right now? Great big ones, and will they affect the fruit? Uh, powdery mildew. Oh, it's powdery mildew. <laughs> 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 um, a little help from the Yes, thank gallery. you, Kim. Um, yeah, uh, so powder, um, uh, powdery mildew, but as far as the fruit, probably should not affect the fruit. And I'm sorry, I'm kind of slow. I have a four-month-old daughter who does not sleep. Um, <laughs> she likes to stay up all night, and so synapses do not fire the best always. <laughs> we love it. Makes you human. <laughs> all right, are you ready, Wayne? Sure, let's go for it. Uh, this is a Blair viewer who has uh, bagworms on shrubs, and, she, and she's wondering, will it do her any good to pick them off and squish them? Pick them off, throw them away, get them away from those plants because they haven't hatched yet. All right. Uh, second question about bagworms is, is there a natural predator of bagworms? Yes, there are some things that eat bagworms. Uh, they're easier to eat when they're not in their bags, so when they, before they've made them, and there are some parasitic wasps that attack them as well. All right, uh, third question on bagworms. If you don't get rid of them, will they spread? Yes, <laughs> by crawling and by air dispersal with a silk balloon. All right, uh, we had a viewer who said, where are the insects apparently driving across the state? No smashed bugs on the windshield. Things have been a little slow to get started this year. All right. They will come. All right, uh, this is a carny viewer who found tiny white worms, worms in quotes, in puddles. Any idea what they might have been? 
tough to say. More than likely, they're small earthworms. Uh, they could be a parasitic worm or a nematode as well. Um, but white and small, I wouldn't call them a horsehair worm because typically when we get a horsehair worm in their water phase, they can be a foot long or longer and they're black. <laughs> yeah. Hence the name horsehair. All right. Thank you all. And you won. And yeah, we don't have that trophy, but that's, yeah, okay. that's okay. We still know you won. All right. Nice job. I don't job, know where it's all. been. <laughs> that's true. Are you ready for your next set of pictures? Sure. Oh, plant of the week first. Oh, I always forget that because right. we're Me too. strange here. Me too. I shouldn't forget that. Okay, what we have here, uh, purple, lavender, purple, and lavender. So the taller, the shorter one here, this is a dwarf Korean lilac. Um, it's kind of a dense, rounded shrub. They have smaller florets than regular common li lilac mm -hmm. and tinier leaves that are really cute. So, and this one is... Um, well, the tight panicles too, and I have one of these in my yard too, and it's just loaded right now, and they're not the open, loose panicles, so it really makes a stunning display. Um, this one is a it's fragrant, but a little bit different than regular lilac. Uh, rarely has powdery mildew or bores that the common lilac is very susceptible to, and this one can be sheared and do pretty well. The taller one that's drooping a little bit, this is Dame's Violet or Sweet Rocket. This is one of our introduced wildflowers. So it was brought here with the immigrants and introduced. It's not one of our native wildflowers, but it has naturalized. And you do find it in a lot of uh, natural areas growing. It, it will spread. It's quite pretty, probably not a cut flower, <laughs> but it, you see it growing in all the ditches, right? In many ditches right now in, in shady areas. Um, you know, just a, a pretty ornamental wildflower that's out there blooming. Excellent, thank, thank you, you, Kelly. All right, now you get some pictures, Wayne. That's right, it's different. I'm staring across the table at Kelly. I'm not used to staring across the table at someone. I was gonna make faces at you during the lightning round, but I didn't. All right, this is a, this is a viewer who has a hundred emerald green arbor vitae, uh, and he's, they, he, they treat them with a winter desiccant, but they're seeing some damage they think is winter burn. And then they also see something that they think is not winter burn, completely overwhelmed. It's starting to look like this. They had an arborist come out who thought it might be spider mites. I think we have a close up. What do you think here? Well, there was something else in that question that you didn't get to that really concerned me is they're spraying twice a year for bagworms. Pooh. Mm -hmm. And when you're spraying twice a year for something you may not even have, you're gonna take care of your beneficial insects to the coffin mm -hmm. rather than to the table to eat those things that are gonna be harming your plants. Um, if this is spider mites, uh, you should be able to do the white sheet of paper test where you knock it off and you should see dots scurrying around on that paper. Uh, that's how you would be able to tell. I would really try to steer away from that twice calendar scheduled insecticide application uh, to help pr promote your beneficial insects. It'll help keep those spider mites under control. All right, thank you, Wayne. And now you've got an Ashland viewer that has a 15-year-old Lakeview Mugo pine. New candles die, what can be used to treat it. They, th they think it's a fungus. I disagree. Right. As yeah. do I. <laughs> As do I. If you look really close, you can see some pitch in here, and then amongst the pitch, you find um, frass again, and that's our cue that this is something else going on. Uh, we did have a follow-up picture that didn't have time to get on the right. air, but it was perfect. You could see on the needles where the pine, uh, I mean, get pine shoot tip moth has uh, the eggs have hatched and the caterpillars have burrowed into the base of the needles. So you could see the frass coming out from the base of the needles and they haven't burrowed into the stem yet, which is why when they peeled that stem back, they weren't finding anything because those caterpillars haven't gotten big enough and moved in yet. Uh, we are past the treatment window. Uh, next year, what they will want to do is time an insecticide application for when the needles just begin to start to elongate because that's when those eggs tend to hatch. All right, thank you, Wayne. This is a Valparaiso uh, viewer, Kyle, who has fiddly fig okay. in the sunroom. It's been growing very well, and then all of a sudden it's starting to look like this. On the front and on the back, looks like rust. She doesn't see any insects. Okay. Um, so I do think the 
think there's actually two different things that are going on here. Um, and so for the, the first picture where we had those larger blotches, that were kind of those water-soaked blotches, to me that uh, looks like a bacterial disease. And so there is a bacterial leaf spot of a fiddler leaf of, of fiddler figs. Um, I think that's what's occurring there. Tends to, we tend to see it a lot more um, in situations where plants are overwatered. And then on those black spots on the back of the leaves, I actually wonder if that's not just a response to the overwatering um, that's, a, that's potentially been occurring, making that uh, bacterial uh, leaf spot worse. And so yeah, let it dry out a little bit if possible and probably need to prune out those, um, those larger leaves. I doubt they'll recover, but overall the, uh, the fiddler fig should be fine. All right, and then you have another house plant. Uh, it's been doing this for some time. This is a uh, Sioux City viewer. So um, this again could be, could be a few different things. I kind of think that it's uh, Phytophthora is what we're dealing with here. And so uh, pothos can get a, a Phytophthora root rot that it rots the roots and then the stems and petioles re remain green, but then we'll get these large black areas of the leaf. And so I kind of think that's what's going on. And so again, um, just try to let it dry out a little bit if possible. All right, thank you, Kyle. You have uh, three rather quick I okay. um, ID ones here. Okay. The first one is Sarpy County Pasture, grows 10 to 12 feet mm -hmm. tall, very invasive. What is it and how can it be done, done in? <laughs> okay, well, it, you know, it kind of looks like buffalo berry, but the fact that they're describing it as being very invasive, um, I'm wondering if it's not autumn olive. They can be confused for each other. Um, they both have thorns, as you can see here. The autumn olive will have alternate leaves and the buffalo berry will have opposite leaves. So that's another way to identify it. Um, autumn olive is an invasive species, so you definitely want to control it. But since this person wants to control it either way, um, if they're 10 to 12 feet tall, I think pruning it off and then doing a basal kind of a stump treatment. So right when you prune, you would want to use, uh, treat those cuts with glyphosate or a Roundup product, which is systemic or some type of a brush killer following the label direction. All right. And you may have to go back and as it sprouts up and do it again a few times. Okay, so this one, they want to know, is this a friend or is this a foe? Okay. This is in Hastings, and she sent a couple of pictures of it. Okay, this is Western Salsify, and it's another one of those introduced wildflowers brought here with uh, the immigrant, so not a native. Uh, not necessarily a really bad plant. Uh, it has that deep taproot, and it spreads by seed. Mm -hmm. So it won't spread by rhizomes or stolons or anything like that. It mainly just spreads by seed. So, and it, it has a looks like a dandelion seed head, but it can be up to four inches uh, in diameter, so it's quite a bit larger. So not a bad plant, um, but probably was planted by the wind and not necessarily one you want to keep. All right, and then a uh, another one for ID is, this is near Wayne on the acreage, and they want to know what it is, pure and simple. This is a choke cherry. Mm -hmm. So if you have berries and you're not spraying anything in the area, you're not supposed to be spraying, enjoy the choke cherries. And Exactly. Harvest and eat them. Exactly. All right. Well, last week we showed you some great selections of peonies, and another plant that people love in the landscape is boxwood. For our second feature tonight, Jeff Culbertson will give us some good advice on managing boxwood. So having an evergreen shrub in your landscape is one of the things we all kind of struggle with. What kind of, what kind of plant do we want? What do we want it to do? What do we want it to look like? How do we want to prune it? That sort of thing. So for us, uh, junipers, which is a very common plant you'll see in a lot of landscapes, is very durable, it's very flexible, it can be grown in a lot of situations. Um, they come in low growing, uh, mid height, and then those tall columnar ones that you'll see in the landscapes. They have their disease and insects problems like any plant, but that's a common plant. Use is another one that a lot of landscapes will have. And again, they, they're a little bit more fussy uh, compared to junipers, but that's another plant that you can get uh, low, very low growing use. You can get very upright growing use and also mid height ones. And, and then they all have their own pruning requirements and, and needs as far as how we're gonna manage them in the landscape. So one of the other evergreens that do well in our landscapes are boxwoods. And we think of kind of the classic hedged 
boxwood. Um, and so, but there are a variety of plants out there that are upright and narrow, uh, mid-height, kind of like these, that are more spreading. And then there are some new globe, uh, much smaller, denser, uh, compact boxwoods out there as well. Some things to think about boxwoods when we're, when we're uh, caring for them and when we're selecting a planting site. We want a place that has, the soil has good drainage, uh, so we don't want a heavy clay soil. We want something that does it, the soils don't stay saturated for a long period of time, but they do drain off. Uh, good fertile soil, so really like any plant that wants, uh, most plants are gonna want soils with good drainage and decent fertility. Uh, with these in particular, we want to keep them out of windy areas. So they can be full sun or shade. Typically, you see them in shadier spots because we're mostly concerned with winter winds and even summer drying winds. Um, and as most evergreens, you may need to add supplemental uh, water to them throughout the winter months in particular and if we have a, a droughty period. Um, so that's something to help prevent that winter burn and some of that dieback that you may see in the winter is that we're going to want to continue to water them periodically through the winter. And then as far as pruning these, one of, some things to keep in mind, if uh, with any evergreen, so yews are another one, uh, if you do a lot of hedging, you end up with most of the leaves and dense growth on the outside of the plant, which shades the inner part of the plant, and so you end up with kind of a dead zone in the middle. And so we want to try to avoid that. So what we'll do is we'll go through and um, kind of systematically go through and take some of the bigger branches out, some of the bigger areas, maybe do some evening, but we're not gonna do a lot of hedging on these. Um, and again, if you choose to do that, if you choose you want a real hedged plant, that's fine, but understand that over time, you're gonna end up with just all your leaves, the green is gonna be on the outside, and you're gonna have, if anything happens to the plant, you'll end up with a hole in it that will take time to, to fill back in. So. Uh, boxwoods are maybe a good choice. Take a look at them. Make sure that when you pick a boxwood, you pick one that fits the size that you want ultimately. Um, I can't make this become a tall upright one. It's always going to be lower growing and more spreading. Um, so make sure you pick the right plant for the right place. Boxwood can be a versatile plant in the landscape. It'll need a little protection to keep it from winter damage especially as you head west. So these are not plants that want to live in the western part of the state. All right, so let's pile through some questions here. This is, a, uh, this is an ash question for you, Wayne. 46 years old, they have treated it for EAB two years ago. They plan on doing it again. She doesn't see woodpeckers, but she is seeing that the bark is now becoming easily picked off. And this is in Trainer, Iowa. She wonders, uh, she wonders, what do we think here for what's going on? If you, if you look at this picture right here, in the, about the upper third line, right dead center, there's a borer hole. Mm -hmm. That reminds me of carpenter worm, hmm. where they will attack the large portions of the tree, and carpenter worm does bore into the wood a fair ways, and they create a larger tunnel. So this is creating a larger wound internal to parts that are not going to be growing anymore. So I would be concerned about structural integrity of the tree, especially if the bark is starting to peel off and there's more than just a couple of holes. All right, thank you, Wayne. Probably not what she wanted to hear. And we have shroom time. Right. Yay! <laughs> the first, this is actually on a, a nine-year-old Crisandra plant. So this is a house plant, uh, Smith Center, uh, Kansas. Getting these yellow shrooms at the base. What's going on? Uh, looks to me like slime mold. Um, and so really not anything to worry about. Just let it dry out and it'll kind of blow away and turn to dust. All right. Now we have a uh, Fontenelle Forest viewer sent us this one. What do we think this one is? I think this is a pallid bolete. Not entirely mm -hmm. sure what type of bolete it is, but it's most likely a bolete. Um, just a reminder, anytime we are doing mushroom pictures, it's a good idea. I, I love having the hand there for, for size, but also we like to see the side um, so we can see what the stem is looking like and then also the underside of the cap too. All right, and now you have a tree question or not question. <laughs> you got this one because this is what the base of this particular uh, tree lilac looks like. And would we, yeah, this falls to you to see. Yes, yeah. uh, so this is, um, so the bottom part of this picture, we see this kind of big old gall that's forming and this is likely crown gall. Um, it's caused by a bacterial disease. 
um, really just forms these big big galls. No, uh, there's no treatment for them, so this is going to be a, a goner. All right, and then we have one more for you, and this is a beautiful backyard tree, 25 feet tall in papillion. It's a spruce. They're concerned about this. Uh, this is uh, Cytospora canker. Um, so anytime we have that white pitch that's coming down, tip, especially on a spruce, it's often going to be Cytospora. Not a whole lot you can do for control aside from anything to maintain overall tree health. Um, really no, no chemical controls for this one. All right, thank you, Kyle. Hosta time, we've okay. had lots of questions, Kelly. This is an interesting one though. This is a picture of some of them. This is Gold Coast, smaller variety, not leafing out well. Is this insect fungus or critter underground? Okay. Well, um, we are seeing some frost damage on hostas and if they're thinner leaved or they were a little bit younger leaves, maybe you're right up against that metal. Um, that could be creating issues. If it's something like that, it'll start to grow and have normal leaves. Could, sometimes there's viruses that get into hostas. I don't know if that's what this is. Kyle would have to address that. Yeah. But wait, wait and see. It's either a virus or it could be frost damage.